I'm glad to see so many of you here today. I'm especially thankful that I'm able to be here with you. And uh, I come up the step like that because one of my legs is 91 years old. And the other one complains about doing all the lifting. <laughs> and uh, somebody asked me, oh, so from my knees up, I feel pretty well. But I did have a restless night, and I am uh, uh, not very full of energy today. I'm not hiding from you behind this, but I do need the desk to spread out some things here. I don't intend to make a, an outstanding performance, but I have a great topic. I'm glad for it because for the first seven months of this year, it has been a blessing to me to make notes to myself and think over and hunt scriptures and so forth. And uh, I hope it will be a blessing to you. And I hope you'll keep the, the uh, volume so everybody can hear me a little better than I could hear Michael. Um, I don't mind speaking out, but uh, my voice may not be clear to all of you. Let's begin with prayer. And this prayer will be led by Saul of Tarsus from his words of prayer to the churches. And I want you to listen carefully. You may want to pray something of your own thoughts along at this time, but uh, this will bring his prayers for the glory of God to our attention. And from each of these, he leads on into discussion. And sometimes I'll read with it. That will mean that uh, we, we will get acquainted with this subject. Paul mentions the word glory a great many times. And we may go years without talking about any kind of glory of this sort. So let's begin in Romans 15. Whatever was written in earlier times were written for our instruction so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure Brother Victor Knowles will do well with that later on in this meeting. But that's the prayer we should have. And now I turn to the book of Ephesians and begin with verse 14, 15. For this reason, too, I, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. This is the prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation, which you have from him, through the knowledge of him. I might comment here that many of you use the revised or the new international version. It says, in order that we may know him better. There's nothing wrong with that purpose, but that's not what Paul's talking about. He uses the word, the preposition N here, commonly a place. Of course, in the knowledge of Christ is not a place, but it is an instrument. Con constantly, especially in Ephesians and Colossians, Paul uses N in an instrumental sense. By means of the knowledge of Christ, we have this revelation from God. Now, what's that for? So that I pray, he says, 18, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know three things, the hope of his calling, that you will know the riches of his glory in his own inheritance in the saints, and so that you will know, 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, made him to sit in the, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. 
and he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him to be head over all things in the church. Now, the church is not what happens in buildings like this. The church is not what happens in meetings on Sunday. The church is you, the way you comb your hair, put on your clothes, go about your business, the food you choose to eat, the way you spend your time, what you pay attention to. That's the church. We are the church. And that needs to be in your mind and brought up again and again as we think of glory to God in the church. It's our daily life. It's our unconscious direction when we, we turn this way and that because we are human but not filled as both Levain and his son Isaac spoke so well, filled with Christ. I was really impressed that I hadn't heard Levain preach before, but I've gone up to uh, the church he served in Indiana and, and we sort of contacting him, but I'm impressed that he said, God cannot use you until you're dead to self. God dwells in us and we glorifies himself in us when we give up living our own life. You'll see this more now as we turn to Ephesians, the third chapter. The Apostle Paul said in 13th verse, I ask you not to lose heart in my, in my tribulations on your behalf. Those tribulations I have are for your glory. Now that's another study how that works. But for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom all fatherhood in heaven gets its name. That's my translation, and I will try to defend it if you want to talk to me about it. I don't think he's talking about family. I think he's talking about fatherhood in general. It's the abstract form of the word pater here. And translators don't seem to get the idea quite. <laughs> this is the prayer that he would grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inward man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, faith in him, not faith in confidence, not self-confidence. Faith in him gives up everything to him, trusts everything he does, everything he says, everything he gives, and makes no complaints. Christ dwells in your hearts through faith. Without faith, he cannot get in. And that being rooted and grounded in true in love, you may be able, become able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and to know the love of Christ which is incomprehensible, which passes, surpasses knowledge that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. That's almost more than I would dare to say, but Paul said it. I can so readily agree with Colossians 2 that Christ was filled with all the fullness of God and all the fullness of God dwelled in him in a bodily form. But here it says, Christ dwelling in your heart through faith, you living to know his love may be filled unto all the fullness of God. Who do you think we are anyway? To become the children of God, we become like God, we become a part of the family of God, we become the very body in which Christ, the God, the maker of our universe, dwells on earth today to live in us. And it's in this body that Christ manifests the glory of God. A little later we'll talk about how Christ spoke of himself manifesting the glory of God in his original incarnation. Now to him who is able to do far more, exceedingly more than we are able to ask or think, according to the power which works in us, to him be glory in the church Amen. and in Christ Jesus unto all generations forever and ever. Mm -hmm. 
Did you pray any on that? The Apostle Paul was praying for us and leading us in prayer and mentioning these things. When Paul wrote to the Romans from Corinth, he said, May the God of endurance and encouragement, King James said, comfort and patience. And when you read comfort, we think of, oh, uh, couch in the shade with a cool drink, or patience of not being disturbed or aroused by anything at all. When our little college began down at Bentonville in 1940, we acquired an old uh, kind of worn out Jersey cow with very champion blood to raise some stock for the college. We had some ground. We, we bought 20 acres and a hotel in Bentonville in 1940 for $9,000. At a terrible time raising that much money in those days. But we named that cow Patience. Seemed unperturbable about anything. And most people think patience and comfort is something I have a right to, you know. God helps me to have indifference and indolence. <laughs> oh, that just makes me shudder. I'm so glad for these translations that say steadfastness or perseverance and encouragement. And you get these from the scripture, it says here. So that you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a purpose in Christianity, in the church, as we, in God's concept of the church. The word church isn't too good a word for it, but uh, the community, the assembly, the body, the family of God in Christ is here on earth yet, but we are not to be like the earth, we're to show to the earth something special. What life is when we don't live it for ourselves? Paul used this word glory many times, and you'll hear them over and over, and I hope that the uh, much dwelling on this subject this week will help us to get this something unforgettable in our system to, to fill our heart with a desire every day to do something that will give God glory. Yes. Jesus talked about it too in Matthew 5, 16. Jesus said, do your good works so that they're seen of men, that they may glorify God. Amen. And just after that, 6, 1, he said, make, take care that you don't do your good works to be seen by men to get glory for yourself. Ah, the motive is the whole difference. Don't be afraid to do all the good you can all the time you can to all the people you can and all the ways you can in order that God may get the glory. People wonder, why is he so stupid Then makes himself a sucker to everybody's impositions? Yesterday evening I had a call when I was busy working on this from a man that I had helped over and over and through the last several years, oh, eight maybe, he even bought a vehicle from me about uh, six or eight years ago that he's only half paid for. He even mentioned last night that after the first year when he got some bills paid, he's going to pay some more on it. And uh, he was asking me for the use of some of my tools. And after these, I told him about these meetings these three days, and I said, Friday or Monday, uh, we can get together, I'll bring them over to you. Uh, he, he is a very... <laughs> well, needy man. <laughs> it was hard to hear over the phone. It's, it's amazing. The, the time we've, we've tried, my preacher David Shepherd and I have tried to talk to him directly about his defying the scripture about living without marriage with a woman and coming constantly to church. We were concerned about how, what we should be doing about this then. He just said, well, the government would take away over uh, a big section of our income if we got married, so I can't do that. We said, well, if you trust God and the people of God help you, you can do what God wants you to do. Soon after that, he got a, a connection with a 
preacher of some kind, I don't know what sort, who had him uh, live in a little house of his and do some work for him and not charge him any rent. We said, see, God provided for you. No, that didn't change his mind. But the woman had to leave him in order to pursue her faith. And she is very constant at the church and, and a somewhat limited type of person, but she is uh, very expressive about the only hope she has is faith in Christ and Christ living in her. Well, I hope we can still... Now, the last time I talked to Charlie, um, he said he was going to church somewhere. I don't know just where. But I'm sort of pleased that he would be willing to call me up about using some of my tools again because I've never turned him down on anything he asked me to do for him. One time he asked me to borrow $10, and he's going to pay me back on Thursday. And about Friday, I was at his place just to see he'd moved to a new place and she suggested to him that I'd like to give him $10 so he could pay me back like he promised. <laughs> he didn't get the point, I guess. I hope you did get some kind of a point. Um, but don't say, well, I've done, Peter said, is it enough that I could forgive my brother seven times in a day? No, Jesus said 70 times seven or even 77. It doesn't matter. You're nobody going to count that high anyway. But you see, you become rather something not human, something out of this world, when you let Jesus use you to the glory of God. Try it. Anyway, it's a good deal. What is glory? Well, sometimes symbolized by bright, bright light. The glory of God at the tabernacle is shown by the Shekinah glory. Um, the presence of God on Mount Sinai, just too bright for Moses' eyes to see. He could see something in the afterglow. Maybe see the stones sizzling after him <laughs> went by. But uh, when, when Saul of Tarsus saw the resurrected Christ on the way to Damascus, it blinded his eyes. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, his garments glistened brighter than the white in the snow and his face brighter than the sun. This is something God uses symbolically to represent glory. It means favored attention, fame, recognition, praise, honor, high appreciation, heartfelt exaltation, not merely words. Sometimes I get a little uncomfortable eh? in an audience that's singing many, many times, I exalt thee, I exalt thee. I exalt the, um, I hope so. How long after the words cease? Sometimes this word points to the qualities or merit which deserves and receives such honor. God is full of glory. The whole world is full of his glory. The universe declares his glory. Our lives of self-interest, getting things for ourselves, lives of greed, which is idolatry, weak and unnoticed greed, but greed does not glorify God. Real generosity, love at noticeable cost does bring glory to God. Abraham's willingness to give his son Isaac as a sacrifice brought some glory to God. Amen. God does not ask us to give our sons, but he does ask us to present our own body as a living sacrifice to him. Romans 12, 1 and following. You familiar with that? Romans 6, after talking about baptism, said, now that you have quit being a slave to sin. You have become a slave to righteousness. Amen. Now, how did Christ glorify the Father? I have a special little slip here that will remind me of some things I especially thought on that, and I don't know in what order I have it. 
But turn with me to the 12th chapter of John, or think with me, beginning at the 23rd verse. Jesus said, the hour has come. Now, this is just a couple of days before the crucifixion. He'd been teaching the apostles, and um, the day before this, or maybe it was earlier in the same day, he had been teaching uh, so long as the, the day of great questions and of strong parables of judgment and so forth, the Tuesday of the last week. This seemed like maybe it was on Wednesday. Some Greeks, some foreigners, some Gentiles came and told Philip, we would see Jesus. Philip came to Andrew and told him the problem, brought the problem, but not the Greeks, I guess. And Jesus just, uh, what uh, Isaac referred to, uh, he, he said, uh, this grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die and disappear, or it abides by itself. It doesn't produce anything. If we just live our lives for ourselves, very clean, very respected, and very useful in the church and uh, never do anything exceptionally because God demanded it of us and we surrendered to him. We will, if we don't die, we won't live. Thank you, Levain. In order to live a new life, you got to die. In order to walk on the water, you have to get out of the boat, in other words. We want to stay in the safe zone, in the comfort zone, and never get out of uh, uh, what's respectable by the selfish people of this world. Well, let's go back to John 12, 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, you, we talked about that. Let's skip down to 26. If anyone serves me, well, let's start 25. He who loves his own life loses it. Anybody who cherishes, preserves, supports, protects his own life is bound to lose it. Losers, keepers will be losers and finders will be keepers. Losers will be finders. That's the way Jesus put it. He that Amen. loses his life for my sake, he's going to find something. Amen. He who keeps his life for his own sake, he's going to lose something. Everything. Amen. And that the world doesn't understand that. Not very easy for you to understand that. I wrote an article on that published in Standard Reflections one time. Never got a response from anybody. But I think it's a kind of you know, an upside down thing. Most people want to turn it around up the other way. And this causes Jesus to say, 27, now as my soul troubled. Now is this, the hours come, the Son of Man be glorified. Now my soul is troubled. Why? What shall I say? Father, deliver me from this hour, but for this cause I came to this hour. Then Jesus said, Father, glorify thy name. And a voice from heaven said, I have, son, and I will. Amen. And he did. Amen. Jesus said, this voice has not come for my sake, or probably meaning only for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. And the ruler of this world is going to be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up on the cross to die, will draw all men unto myself. Yes. It's the cross that glorifies God. Amen. It was the fact that Jesus in Gethsemane faced all the dread of giving up his own life and his own harmony with God and becoming, being made sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteous of God in him. It was a time, a terrible test, a terrible demand. 
but a complete surrender, nevertheless, every time, not my will, but thine be done. Now, the only secret of doing this, being a glory to God in the church, is not my will, but thine be done. Too many church boards think they can make decisions for the church. When really, the only decision they have to make is a decision yielding to God. That's the main thing. Find, seek, and follow without fear God's way. This way Jesus did it. Glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus. I want to refer to another scripture. I'm not sure whether it's on this list today or not. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 11. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But you resist him firm in your faith, knowing that Daniel resisted the lions in the lion's den. <laughs> well, that isn't what he's talking about here. Is it? Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After that you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself complete the job, perfect you, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the full control and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's the only way there will be glory unto him, unto all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'm sort of pleased in a way that some of our church people are even more saying, well, we can face all kinds of things because God is in control. I've been trying to remind some of them that God isn't in control yes, you're sub unless you're submitting to his control. God isn't in charge if you try to be in charge. Well... We need to be getting to how can we give glory to God. How, what do we have to give to God? Faith, attention, thanksgiving, joy, and letting, and letting God direct and perfect and letting God provide and, and produce in us what he wants to The whole earth is full of his glory, Isaiah was told by those cherubim, seraphim, weren't they? His glory is in his excellence, his superiority, his perfection without any exception. We glorify him then simply in the way we begin to recognize his glory, his perfection. In the way we become very thankful for his superiority, that one time a young man came to me, uh, rather desperate about his uh, obsessive habits, and uh, he was afraid, you know, he, he, the Bible kept threatening his uh, confidence in God, his hope in salvation, and he, uh, so my counsel to him, I'll leave it to, to, I said, you turn to God and thank him that he is so perfect and so just. And uh, they, there's no darkness or sin in him. Thank him that he judges and destroys those who persist in sin. Thank him that you can trust in him and then throw yourself upon his mercy. When we recognize his right to judge and to destroy us, we're ready to receive his mercy. He's ready to give his mercy. The day you feel absolutely condemned by God may be the happiest day of your life. If it will let you be so far and so flat on your back that you can look no way but up. If you will actually turn to God and trust God and let God, he can pull you out of the deepest ditch, out of the miry clay, set your feet on the rock and establish your way. 
we must begin with the recognition that God is full of glory and God has all power and all right to judge and to destroy that which is not pleasing to him. Third, we can always be respectful and admiring and praising him for all that he is and does. I don't mean you can't stop uh, voicing it orally, but uh, may your heart be always rejoicing in his. But he is just too big for us. He is just too wonderful for us. He is just so far uh, beyond us. I don't know whether I told you once before about Sherwood Smith's mother from Minnesota visiting him when he's preaching in western Oregon, I think Springfield, Oregon. She wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. He took her to a high coastal hill and let her see a lot of ocean. She looked this way and that way and that way. Hmm, not half as big as I thought it was. Now she had no thought about what a tiny fraction of the ocean she could see. What little God makes known to us, what little God some people, that's what little some people hear about God, they say, that's not the God I'd propose to believe in. Oh, what a dreadful thought. If it's God, you don't have any right to be criticizing him. And you have no concept of how small a fraction of God you have any perception of. It's just too big for us. Any lesson about God's judgment, God's rightness, about, God's understand, about understanding God cannot be too casual. It needs to be conducted in an attitude of pure submission and realizing that we, we're, we're dealing with divine things, the infinite, who made a universe that no one can tell. Uh, I laugh sometimes as the astronomers say, we're seeing about halfway across the universe. They have no idea how small a fraction of it they're seeing. He is so great in his wisdom, his power, his scope of knowledge that he can know the thought and the intent of all of us at one time. He not only knows the thoughts of those who are already thinking about dinner or those that are wondering about something back home or those that are worrying about how to make money or something like that. Or, but when we're praying, Silently, and we all pray different things. God knows every one of those. Now, the awful thought is that there are six and a third billion people on this earth, and he knows the thoughts and the feelings and the desires of every one of them at the same time. We have no concept of that ability. We just... Uh, Wonder should we get too close to God? Well, God won't let us in his presence until he has made us over and filled us full with his fullness in Christ. Give glory to God? Well, let him work his will in his wonderful way not by crushing us into impersonal matter compelled by force to be something other than what he made us, but by giving himself, himself for us and himself to us. And by his grace, through faith, we can accept the sentence of death gladly. Yes, death for our sins and our sinful self and consent to die to sin and self, and be buried in baptism into his death, and become partakers in his resurrection, unto newness of life in him. So what do we do to give glory to God? Stop being busy about getting satisfaction and glory for ourselves.
Some of us have had the privilege to go to maybe five or ten nations and teach here and there and, and through the years. I have been preaching 71 years, Michael, and, and I've preached in all the continents but Europe, I, um, I guess. But uh, every time you think about uh, being known far and wide, something like that, so what? There are worse people than I that have been known. <laughs> no accomplishment. Give attention to God's grace, his teaching, his promises. Set our hearts and our minds, this is quoting Paul again, on the things that are above, not the things that are upon the earth. Now, the things that are upon the earth, everything around you. Set your minds on the things that are above, where Christ is, see the right hand of God, because you're dead, you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ shall be manifested, you, what is it? Will be manifest with him in glory. In glory. If we give up self, he has a whole new life for us. If we give up our glory, he'll show us the real thing. Give attention to his promises and set our hearts on them. This is how we can bring glory to God by putting all our gratitude and our affection and our attention upon what he has done for us and what he is making of us and rejoicing daily. What I am to be, I'm now becoming and ask him to prepare us for that which we cannot grasp now. Prepare us to be empty and ready for the full dose of all the love and grace he has for us. Amen. We've seen some love in a mother dog for her puppies. We've seen some love. My Siamese blue-eyed cat seems to have sometimes a definite affection for me. He comes right up and wants to put her whiskers against mine, and she has the longer whiskers. <laughs> Well, <clears throat> we know so little about love. We talk about love, say so much about it. God's love is just immensely, unimaginably greater. And he wants to fill us with that kind of desire to give, desire to be, help, desire to be um, like him. That's his glory. Amen. You see, he has all the glory. The only thing we can do to glorify God is let him use it and to reflect it to him and let him ex expand to his. The church is the body, the presence, the working presence of Christ in the world today. Is the world glorifying Christ because of the church? Oh, so often not. I didn't want to get into why God is not glorified in the church, but I have two things I want to bring to your attention. Why God is not real to us every day. Well, we forget what he has done. We ascribe his creation to evolution. We ascribe his providence to chance and luck. We ascribe his moral commands to traditional family values. That's an insult to God. Amen. We think of God as acting in the dim distant past or the far distant future. We do not accept God's forgiveness and our sins to the extent of our sins to the extent that it really changes our guilt or makes us want to forgive others. If you receive forgiveness, you want to forgive others. Amen. This is very basic and important part of the reality of God in our minds and hearts. We're concerned about looking good to certain people or all people, feeling good about ourselves more than we are about what God thinks of us. We have our minds, our attention and feelings occupied with the things of this world. We just talk about Colossians 3, 1 to 3. We let the TV take too much of our attention. I turned mine off six or eight months ago and haven't any desire to get back to it. We neglect the worship time. Maybe even commit the sin of getting up on Sunday morning deciding to go to the church. Do you get up every morning and decide whether to wear clothes? 
kind of a foregone decision, isn't it? If you belong to Christ, you belong to Christ's people. When Christ's people are meeting to observe the remembrance of the death of Christ, greatest thing in the world ever happened to me. We neglect the worship time and the absence of true worship in our hearts when we're at the worship place. And worship doesn't belong to a time and place. It belongs in your heart. Amen. We trust too much in ourselves and the products of science and technology to solve our problems and furnish our needs. Right. Only when we lose all those things we can be conscious of God. I'm glad that I met John Noble and got to hear him in person and bought his book and yeah, there's a record too. John Noble was a German whose father had a business and they were captured by the Russians in the Second World War and they were put in prison and the prison was miserable and the food was starving and, and uh, eventually John got so weak that he couldn't crawl to the door to get the bowl of weak gruel that was furnished him. And that's getting altogether undone. When he couldn't do that, he finally just said, God, you'll have to take over. If you want to preserve my life, you can, and you can have it. How I found God in the communist prison in, the, in Red China, in Red Russia. I heard about him at the communist clinic. Then he came to Joplin. He spoke in our memorial hall. I was so glad he did. But he said, we never gave God credit. We never gave God attention. We never tried to do God's will as long as we had money and we had power. But when he could not do another, couldn't even crawl four feet to the door to get the only nourishment available, then he turned to God. Thank God for that day. Amen. We ban all reference to God from our schools and in government affairs. It's certainly a way of making God seem unreal and unworthy. We don't speak naturally about God as if he were real and someone we know and care about. We talk about important realities which we face in life which produce consequences important to us. But if we do not talk about God in our homes and to our friends, how can we be trusting God as a significant reality every day in our lives? The separation of church and state was supposed to keep human government from interfering with the rule of God in the lives of individual believers. But it's being used now as a basis to deny the rule of God, or even the mention of God, or even the recognition of God. We need a lot more believers, not only in Washington and in government here and there, who will stand up for the recognition of God even though we follow the Constitution, we don't want any group of men, any organization ruling over all the rest as the established church. I think you need to realize that the established religion of America is evolution. It is. It's established as a religion. It's uh, held sacred. And you don't dare even teach science in science class for fear you might bring somebody a question about evolution. That's the established religion. I'm glad that they don't have one denomination trying to rule over all religion in America. But God still lives. I think anybody can acknowledge God anywhere without establishing a religious political power. In fact, we have too much formal religion and deny the power thereof. We have too much attention to the workings of religion without the power of God working to cancel, to replace all the self-interest and the self-complacency. I don't know whether you want to stay any longer 
I could take time to talk about complacency. Along with all these things I've just said, this is perhaps the worst. We have unjustifiable satisfaction in the state we're in, uh, a lack of awareness of actual dangers or needs or deficiencies, and uh, we have a don't know and don't care attitude because of complacency. Self-interest and self-complacency is one of the main things that keeps God from being glorified in the lives of the individual members of the church. We're smug, contented, not caring. Little Jack Horner sitting in the corner with his Christmas pie, puts in his thumb, pulls out a plum and says, what a good boy am I. This keeps people from going to hear good evangelistic preaching. And if they hear the marvelous grace of Christ, they're indifferent, refuse to receive it, put off, even making a decision, which is a decision not to respond. We have an odious self-righteousness, refusing to see or admit that we have need to be forgiven and made over. No need of improvement or help. And we don't realize that we need to stop where we are and make repairs until the power within us is not of ourselves, but of God. And then the church that has nothing to be proud of but Christ can be a glory to God.